it has to be a full collective. It has to not just be the colleges. It has to be the clubs. It has to be the grassroots. It has to be high school. It has to be everything has to be a collective in in growing the game. There's, there's not just one answer. And I, and I think with rugby in America as well, I do think a lot of people have to put their egos aside. Um, and that's what I'm finding, I'll be honest, is is people are very het up and believing that, well, what they're doing is the right thing. What they're doing is definitely the wrong thing. It's like, well, can we not work all together on this? I, I think you're spot on with, you know, making sure we capture as many people as possible, whether they go to college or not. Um, it's it's a hard, it's a tough landscape, the US, and it, there's no simple answer. Um I know we're all trying to do in our ways, me maybe obviously through media, but I, there's a lot of people who are working hard as well. Um, and I do believe we, we are growing. Um, we just want that growth to be quicker. What is up, Slackers? Thank you for joining us here on Late for Practice, the podcast that interviews your favorite rugby professionals from all over the MLR. Today, I'm joined by an international phenom, Will Hooley. Will's career has seen him Gallagher Premiership, the MLR, and even receiving caps for the USA Eagles. More recently, though, you can find Will on his new show, The Rugby Rundown, on the Rugby Network. Will, how are you doing, man? Will, I'm great, man. Great to be here. And it's a very nice introduction. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. You started playing rugby at age five. I know that your dad signed you up. How did that experience go? What was it like? How did he persuade you to get into rugby? Well, the persuasion probably came from the fact that his mates were rocking up at the same uh, rugby club. So this was Cambridge Rugby Club back in the UK. And I think he just wanted to take his young son son along just to go and see his mates, Uh, which to this day, by the way, are still some of my best mates that I played with at age five. And equally, uh, family friends as well. I was dressed in Liverpool football soccer kit. So I wasn't even prepared to play rugby, really. Um, but I just remember loving it. I, I remember loving everything about the uh, getting dirty, running around, the ability to have the ball in your hands. And then, you, you know, just uh, even back then, we, we still played like tag or touch at the time. But it, it was a bit physical. It was as a five-year-old boy who just wanted to be out of the house. It was ideal. That's what my kids are sold on it. They love getting dirty. They love being physical with each other. It's awesome. When did you decide that rugby was what you wanted to do professionally? What what drove that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it was probably about the age of, of 16. Although, in all honesty, by the age of 12, I was associated with Northampton Saints Academy. Uh, Northampton Saints being in, in the Gallagher Premiership. Um, and I got scouted when I was playing some school rugby and club rugby. So I probably always had a sense that rugby was the, the sport for me, but I enjoyed loads of other sports. So I was playing uh, in the UK cricket, very much the kind of American baseball, um, although a lot of people would argue with that. Um, but everything from your soccer to um, to field hockey to tennis, uh, I was I was a sports fanatic and I was a sports sort of get me get me out there back whatever it might be so I was very much playing all sports but 16 was probably the time when I realized I was on course for a potential potential professional contract in Northampton Saints and I played my sort of first professional men's rugby game at 17 I was still at school but I knew when I was finishing school at, uh, at 18 I did all my exams I you know graduated graduated from high school whatever you want to call it But I went straight into a professional environment. I remember it was what, leaving school on the Friday. We had our like speeches, we call it speech day on the Saturday. And literally within about eight days later, I was in preseason for Northampton Saints professionally. So that's kind of how I, it just sort of naturally happened. But I think really though, even from a younger age, as I say from 12, and even when England dropped that World Cup winning drop goal with Johnny Wilkinson in 2003, rugby was kind of like my passion. Um, and I always wanted to to achieve getting, you know, being a professional. I actually have a book from Clive Woodward 
up of there above me. Okay. How influential was that 2003 team winning the World Cup? How did that affect you as a, a Cambridge kid, UK kid? Well, it was everything. You know, I think ultimately the 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 absolute best that rugby was in, in England was around that time. Sort of 2002 to 2004, it really captured a nation. And I think you find that with any big sporting event. When you go on and win it, you you name it, you, whether it's a city here in the States and they go and win the Super Bowl, it really captures the whole place. I mean, I remember seeing on the TV in Trafalgar Square in London, they did a sort of World Cup winners parade and there were 250,000 people in Trafalgar Square. And I was watching on the TV. I'll, I'll never forget where I was watching. I was watching it with, at my school, we had every school had like an event going on because it was like, I think a Saturday morning, a November morning, English time. Um, and everywhere was packed. And it was it was just the, everything about that whole time of Johnny Wilkinson dropping the World Cup, the whole emotion around it, rugby was firmly on the map. And actually, if I flip it now to the US, this is why I'm really excited for a 2031 and 2033 World Cup, because I know that feeling as a youngster, what it was like. I know winning the World Cup for England, but I'm also thinking with America having just the World Cup in our own backyard, what that's going to do to those youngsters like I was back then, that aspiration or that kind of like, oh, wow, professional rugby's out there and I wanted to go after it. And that's I was probably only about nine years old, 10 years old, old back then, but I kind of wanted to be like Johnny Wilkinson, you know, who didn't at that time. You, well, you then went on to go play for the U18, the U20 team for England. What actually sparked your decision to play for the USA Eagle team I know that your your grandmother allows you to be grandfathered into that situation, but what sparked, like, I'm just going to go play for the USA team? Yeah, look, whenever someone hears my accent, I've, I've always got to be very aware that, um, <laughs> you know, if you cut me in half, am I really red, white, and blue? Well, the, well, the reality is I do very much have uh, American blood in me. Grandmother was born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, the, the story was, is I was playing for Exeter Chiefs in the Gallagher Premiership. I was playing against Worcester Warriors, RIP, as they unfortunately have folded in the last, uh, what is it, couple of years or so. And I was, I came off the bench. I must have had like a 20, 25 minute cameo. My dad was watching with my girlfriend, now wife, uh, now in the stands. And he was sat next to an American couple. And at the end of the game, they, they talked, obviously my dad's mum being the American side. And literally the guy just turned around. He was a guy called Mark Lambourne, who was on the board of directors for USA Rugby. And he just said to my dad, you know, my name's Mark and great to meet you today. I, I'd be interested in speaking to your son. Um, as it very much sounds, he's eligible to play for America. Now, my dad knew this deep down. He always knew this. And it was after that day that a few emails were exchanged between myself, Mark Lambourne, uh, USA Rugby and my agent. And it probably took me though a further year to really get into my process of what the best decision for me was to do at the time. Even though like I knew, for example, Cam Dolan, I've been played with at Northampton. Cam's obviously a, a USA rugby great now. And he had talked to me about it. I always kind of wanted to do it, but also if I wasn't going to be English qualified playing premiership rugby, was that going to have an issue with me for my future? And it ended up, to be honest, well, in the end, just I I decided what was best for me, what was something great for my family. And it was the best decision I ever made. I went on a trip to Germany in 2017 to join the squad, a training camp out there. Uh, but my first cap, my first appearance was in the beginning of 2018. Hands down, the best thing I ever did in my rugby career. And the fact that I'm sat here in San Diego now, living here full time with my wife in America, I do feel patriotic to this place. And even though the accent really doesn't give that away, um, it's a huge honor that I played for the Eagles and represented the USA. USA has always been a melting pot, man. I don't think you have to worry too much about the accent. <laughs> I appreciate that. It, get, it gets me out of trouble sometimes as well here and there. So yeah, it, it, doesn't, do, it doesn't do me bad. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, your first official cap with the USA Eagles came against Canada. Do you, Consider that your first start because you also started against Argentina, but it was uncapped. So what's the like protocol here? Yeah, I mean, it's so weird that those games are not technically capped. You know, we were playing what is known as Argentina 15, but it was a good Argentina side. We actually played well. It was in Los Angeles. 
Dignity Health uh, Park is where we, we played in that stadium where the HSBC Sevens play and the new Los Angeles uh, franchise, RFC LA, are playing. Um, and yeah, I would say that that was really my first moment. I was playing in Los Angeles, the place where my American blood had come from, right? You know, my grandmother had been born not that far away. And for me, that was just so special. My parents were in uh, uh, were in town. And, and, and I just remember it was a great win for us. We hadn't beaten an Argentina 15 for I don't know how long. Um, and we and in the end that year, we went on to win the America's Rugby Championship. So I would probably say consider that was maybe my first proper game, even though it wasn't my first cap. What is the role of the fly half on the pitch? And what's a correlating sport or another position from another sport that you could like say, that's it? I would say a fly half, you could say is a bit like the quarterback. A lot of the plays run through the 10. He's the game manager. He's the attack coordinator. And in many aspects, is kind of the cog of the wheel. And, and I don't mean to sort of, you know, say how great fly halves are because I was one. But reality is, is the 10 is naturally the kind of leader in that team. It has to be. I've played with and also been in the same teams with guys being quite quiet as number 10s and being quality. But ultimately, you're the kind of, you're that bit of bravado. You're that you're that sort of talisman that you have to be in control, and that kind of rings true of a quarterback. Quarterback is the guy who has the ball, and he makes decisions. I know there are various other bits in those decisions, but a lot of the time, that is what the number ten. The ball goes through between the scrum half and the and the fly half. Absolute majority of the time during the game, it goes between those two. So I would say that from American audience is pretty much. A fair comparison. You okay. get the ball, you get the ball out of the ruck or wherever you're back on your own 22. Yeah. You're looking across, you see some space. What are you yes. looking for in that scenario? Well, I think the thing is, well, in, in rugby, a lot of people do think that there's sometimes there's aimless kicking and there's maybe too much kicking going on. And, and the reality is that's, I don't believe true. If you look at all the stats from years gone by, the least amount of kicking is happening now in our in our period. And I know there's a few articles that are coming out on social media about that. Um, now, what you try and do is find grass. And finding grass that turns an opposition, whether it be into the corners or down the middle, turns the opposition, puts the pressure on them. It might be field position territorially. You might be trying to get 50-22s, which is obviously enables you to gain the ball back. Um, but equally as well, if there's not so much grass to find behind the defensive line to turn a team, the ability to put the ball in the air and actually compete for it. And those kicks are really only as good as their chase. But what you find is this has been really used in professional rugby, particularly in the last, I would say, decade. And actually one of the teams that I play for, Saracens, I think they were one of the sort of entrepreneurs when it came to the kick to receive or sort of or kick to gain back possession through putting it high. And as a 10, sometimes when you want to relieve pressure, but you want to try and gain field positions to get the ball back, putting it on like the winger. So then you put the high ball onto his space that then causes a 50-50. And actually, I would say it's not a 50-50 because if the winger in your team has got the run-up, like a 20, 30-meter run-up into jumping into someone to get the ball, you've probably got more chance of winning it. So I think there are loads of ways that kicks can be really successful. Are they always successful? No. I mean, I haven't even talked about the fact of doing a little chip kick in behind the defense. A lot of the time you're finding now defenses are very quick to get off the line. Well, that leaves a lot of space in behind them. So the ability of a fly half to see that and chip the ball over that defensive line and have your attacking line going through to uh, pick up the ball, that can be really effective. You name it with cross kicks as well. You're looking to basically get your winger to the edge to get space where the defense might have bunched in too short and therefore they leave that space out wide. What's the quickest way of getting it? The ball from A to B, probably a cross kick. So there are so many different ways. And I used to love that part of the game. I used to love kicking and I still do. I still do a bit of teaching now. So um, yeah, that there are lots of intricacies and detail as to what makes a good kick, but ultimately you're either trying to win the ball back or you're trying to find space and find trying to find grass. Absolutely. Well, and Portugal made USA look foolish just a couple years, just a couple months ago, because they they knew that how aggressive we were. They knew our line would push up on their line, and they put that ball right behind us all the time the, throughout the whole game. 
Absolutely. And they're naturally very good footballers as well, very good soccer players. So any one of them in their back, back line, I remember doing a big sort of preview of them before the World Cup and I was just looking around. The amount of guys who can kick, having kickers across your back line is really, is a weapon. And I just remember clearly that day um, for the US team, again, trying to get in front of the face of, of Portugal, trying to, you know, shut down an attack where you potentially leave yourself vulnerable elsewhere. When the game is on the line, and you have five minutes, you, sometimes you can see a, a fly half kick for position rather than keeping possession. I'm I'm a big guy. <laughs> Forwards typically would want the, the possession more so than the position. What's your thoughts? When do you make that decision? Honestly, I think a lot of it comes from experience. And I say this, I, I remember games I've played in where I might have done the right thing, I might have done the wrong thing. Um, and you do just learn, you know, how much time is on the clock? How many points are you behind? Where are you in the field? Because the worst thing you can do is, let's say you're, to be honest, if you're five points behind and you're trying to play out of your own 22 and you've still got five minutes on the on the clock, that can be detrimental to you. You are really, the you play a risk over reward kind of game at this point, because if you get rid of the field possession and you get yourself away from your 22 or wherever it might be, then you're then asking the opposition, right, what are you going to do? It's almost asking them to make the mistake and you've got enough time on the clock to be able to do that. But at the same time, you've got two minutes left and you're you know needing a try and you're inside your 22, that's when you've got to go. The reality is you've got to have the ability to to go and score a try because actually, probably on average, it takes at least a minute of play to work up a field from 22 to, to try line. I would say in rugby, it takes at least a minute, probably if not two minutes. Um, so that's what you kind of base your, 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 your thought processes on. But also it might just be about what the opposition is looking like. Are they tired if they're not and they look fresh, you know, well then are we looking tired? Are we looking like we need to, you talked earlier about being a big guy. I mean, like, do I need to basically put this ball in a position that we just relieve pressure for ourselves, maybe for this 90 seconds that gives us 90 seconds to then really go after it rather than going after it now and we just completely lose the plot. So look, is there a perfect answer? No. You have to just read situations, and I believe you get that over time with experience. Absolutely, no. I, I, it's, it's always a fascinating situation when there's like so much time left on the clock, and you see somebody kicking it away, and you're like, why would we give up position possession in this situation? That makes no sense. No, I, and I get that, but then there's uh, unfortunately a lot of those people in the stand don't understand, you know, what how momentum's going, how tired you are, how much fatigue that may be taken out, and then. The reality is then if you make an error in your 22, that's when the, the game could be completely over and you still have four minutes on the clock. So you have to get the balance right. And I, and I stress, it, it's honestly, this is where good leaders and, and people with big experience know best. And no disrespect to those people in the crowd, but majority of the time, I'm not sure they have the same experience. No. And the thing is, is that it's on you. It's it's an ownership thing. It's an ownership play from from a fly half they have to like be happy with their decisions that they make uh absolutely and i and i said before i made decisions in my career that potentially lost us the game i also know i made decisions that that won us the game and it's hard um i always think with a with a particularly a fly half is you're or the the hero or maybe even the villain and you come into that monday morning meeting afterwards and you'll be the first one to be patted on the back but you also might be the first one to be questioned. And I always found that quite interesting. Um, again, through experience, get used to. Um, I like to think maybe in my career, I, I think I won more games than I lost. So that probably <laughs> helped my feeling to, towards it all. But, you know, you do have to take that pressure on, on, on your shoulders. That's part of the position. And I said when I compared it to the quarterback, a quarterback, you are the cog of the wheel. You are the decision maker in this that enables a game plan to happen. You have a very unique experience, both playing in the Premier League and the MLR. So I thought we'd play a little bit of a game. I'm going to give you a team, a stadium, or a player. And I want you to give me the correlating person that you think of just off the top of your head. Okay. First okay. first team, Houston Sabercats. Oh, uh, Leicester Tigers. 
Old Glory DC. Um, I go with Bath. They have the potential to really open up their attack. And I think they might be good for the 2024 season as well. Northampton Saints. Oh, well, I have to... Do I, I would say... No, I can't say San Diego. Northampton's got nothing on San Diego in the place. <laughs> um, Northampton Saints. Again, sparky attack. Um, really good. Ball. I'll go with Utah Warriors, actually. There you go. That's not bad. San Diego Legion. What's the most beautiful place in the UK to pick? I've already picked Bath. Um, I would say Bristol. But currently, San Diego, to be fair, would be more successful. But great facilities, great ambition, really good leadership behind it. Um, and just an all-round really good rugby club. There you go. Gloucester. Oh, you're going to have to pick one of the originals of Major League Rugby, aren't you? So I will go with... Do I go with an original? Gloucester, a bit hit and miss. I'm going to go New Orleans. So I got stadiums now. So Zion's Bank Stadium. Oh, love it. Great, great place to play rugby. Great atmosphere. I would go with X the Chief, Sandy Park. Sandy Park. Interesting. All right. Twickenham Stoop. Oh, another really nice, good location in the city. Relatively much in the city. I will go with Seattle. Okay. Starfire. Yeah, right there in good, the city. Good as atmosphere. Well. Usually buzz, usually a good buzz. Usually got lots of people there. Um yeah, good fans as well. What about Snapdragon Stadium? Oh, there's no there's literally there's literally no <laughs> nothing in the premise that's compared to it. Um I would say though, maybe go and say Ashton Gate in Bristol. I said before about Bristol and San Diego, I think two quality facilities. But honestly, Snapdragon is one of the nicest venues I've played in. I was very impressed going to it last year. So I went to the home opener for the Legion. Amazing. The Warriors. Yeah. And it was yeah, it was really, yeah, really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. And it's only going to get better now, man. It's only going to get better now. They've done a year of knowing the facility and everything like that. I think Legion home games are just going to get better and better. So I got some players here for you that I want you to, to see. This this might be the one where you're like, no, I'm not going to answer that. Uh, Go for it. Mikey Teo. Oh, Mikey Teo. Um, now, oh, well, he wasn't in the premiership. Oh, sorry, he's not now in the premiership, but of Charles Piertau. Someone who has the ability to create something out of nothing. Another fullback who just is electric. Um, yeah, I, I'm a huge Mikey Teo fan. Joe Mahler. Do I dare say Paul Mullen? Uh, no, I can't because they're not the same position technically. Uh, I would say... Um, do, 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 do. We'll, we'll go with Chance Winlewski because he's also got a funny hairdo. Um but they're not the complete same characters, no. Not not completely. But there's, you know, breaking the mold with some of these guys. They're, so. they're, well, they're both, they like breaking the mold. That's the thing. They're both their own <laughs> unique characters is what I'm trying. And they're both the same position. <laughs> Absolutely. Jasper Weiss. Oh, yes. Um, big ball carrying number eight. Wrecking ball. Um, I mean, I would say Hunko... I would say, I would say, Strom gets around the pit field a lot, a little bit of South African heritage. Hunko's still playing, that is. Paul Lasike. Oh, talk of wrecking balls. Oh, goodness. I've had the joy of playing mostly with Paul rather than against him. <laughs> um, I would, I mean, you could say Paul Asiko when he's at Harlequins and just do the, the fact that they're both together. Uh, yeah. No, 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 I, I, I won't, don't worry. Um, I would say, um, is it Simone, is it Simone? Simone Kata, Kata, the um, Tongan centre for uh, Leicester Tigers at the moment. He's been lethal, lethal in the ball carry. Uh, so from your perspective, what makes the sport of rugby so special? Gosh, uh, numerous things that all come into one. I think 
one thing that we really do well is our, our like moral compass in rugby. The fact that we almost, you could say, beat each other up and then shake hands afterwards is pretty mad. And I don't think there's naturally that same respect amongst the teammates and then opposition, referees, and then the accessibility that fans feel very much like part of the players as well. It just feels like a good family oriented, uh, oriented environment that rugby brings. And I do think when I speak to US parents, they've always said, if they compare it to football, say, they love the fact that this rugby culture is very welcoming, but also built massively on respect uh, and good traditions as well. So I would say that's something so great about our sport. And then the other thing which is so good about rugby, again, if I have to compare it to the American sports, which I do love, by the way, as well, is it's pretty free-flowing. It's it's the it's the fact that the ball may be out of play, but then it's quickly back into play with a line out. That you know, you've got scrums, a completely different dimension to a game. You got your piano players and piano pushes, is how I like to call it, with forwards and backs. Um, it's just the whole thing, kick, run, pass, it flows. It, the, the ball's in play for longer. And that for me is like you're kind of ticking all boxes with entertainment. Big hits, um, speed, skill. Um, and in all doing this with the moral good compass that rugby is, I think that's why here in the States it is only going to grow. Um, it just needs to be, I guess, more accessible for people to see it. Because once people see it here in America, I'm absolutely confident they everyone said they enjoyed it. Absolutely. 100%. With with the sport growing in North America, do you think that the future of, of rugby is going to come from colleges? Do you think it's going to come from clubs or somewhere else? Look, I, I'm figuring more about this out myself. I'm sort of educating myself a bit more on this. And look, I think the college is really important. I think the only issue that I personally think there is, is the fractious nature between the college programs. You've got CRAA, you've got NCR. They're both brilliant in their own you know, field. Um, but really, you know, what what is, what's the best for growing rugby in America? We don't you'd assume is everything coming together. I think ultimately the coaching needs to increase and be better. I think therefore you build these players to be able to go into the MLR in, um, I would say, better equipped. I'm not saying, I think there's some brilliant college coaches out there, by the way. Um, and one of which I was with not that long ago, Harry Bennett at UCLA, um, doing a great job there. So I do think the college system, if we can get it, collegiate the programs being funded by the colleges as well that's going to be huge for growing rugby and then how can we affiliate those programs almost with major league rugby teams so that's just on that level but then you have to go right back down and it has to be at the grassroots can we introduce the rugby ball to a kid at the age of five like i was and i know those big programs happening with major league rugby particularly here in san diego imagine rugby it's called that's what they're really trying to do. I know, well, rugby are really on board to try and do that before 2031 and 2033 World Cups because those World Cups are brilliant. But at the same time, it's what's left after that. You know, is there a legacy? Are we genuinely creating pathways and programs that, that can last a massive future, not just an event? And I think that's the key thing which we need to do. And we're all trying to do we're involved in rugby. As you are, Will, you're, you're doing this show. I mean, like, we're all trying to grow the game to have a better future rather than just trying to be a better now. What advice were you given in your career or wish that you were given in your career that would have changed your career for the better? Honestly, just the ability to have that self-confidence to enjoy it more. And I say that more when I look at myself between probably the ages of about 18 to 22, really at around that sort of 21 to 23, 24, Oh, I was playing some really good rugby, um, getting myself in the premiership, playing in Europe. And, you know, I, I, I probably got, though, carried away with results, the fear of making a mistake. And I would say I played for some great clubs, but naturally I think the issue with professional rugby now is some of this great talent is almost coached out of people because you have to set the, the mould right and the set play has to be this and we have to... but. The reality is, is now players are being put into squads that suit what the squad or what the team, how they orchestrate their attack or orchestrate their defence. Um, Marcus Smith is a great example of that. He goes really well for Harlequins in the Premiership. 
because they just they they almost build their team and their structure around Marcus Smith. Is Marcus Smith the same player for England? I'm not so sure because the England structure, how they want to play, is not necessarily for Marcus Smith. And I don't think we get the best performances. When I say we, I mean anyone who's English. So I, it's a hard... It, sorry to go sort of... I, I realise, maybe ask your question again, because I'm not sure I've, no. I've, I've really answered it as such. But um, yeah, it, it's it's tricky not to get things coached out of you, I think now with this professional era. And and really you got to make sure you keep the talent of why people are exciting. I love this answer because I, you can see it in, in North American sports as well. When a coach comes in and they have a system and they run that system and though they don't have the players for it or they have to make adjustments and some coaches are so stubborn that they will not change. And, and that makes it so much harder for a player to be confident versus a coach that comes in and is very good and can change according to what he has on on roster or on staff is is major. I look and, and that's why I realized, sorry, going back to what your actual question was, is what and, and that's for me, maybe I, I knew I had ability. I played what I did and whatever, but there was times where I maybe had that kind of self-doubt uh, at times. And and I'll be honest, Will, like the the guys who really are the top, top, who I've been very fortunate to play with and against, they don't doubt themselves. There, There is very much like they're going to run this show and they'll make mistakes, but they're never worried about, you know, oh, I'm going to lose my place in the team or anything like that. And it's almost verging on arrogance. Um, there's a fine line, but that, that, in my opinion, you look at the Michael Jordans of the world. It's like they have that inner confidence that, they do not care what anyone else thinks. And and maybe I I am that person. Maybe I do worry more about something, not more, but potentially what other people might think. And that's not necessarily always the best for your performance. Absolutely. No, I, I like it. That's a good answer. And it kind of covers the next question that I had, which is what do kids need to do if they want to pursue a professional career as an elite athlete? And it's all about that confidence. It's all about the ability to go, no, I'm just going to take this game over and, and do what I need to do. A hundred percent. And I I always think for young kids in particular, don't get burnt out with one sport. You, you've got to have an ability to play around a, a range of sports because then that gives you, for example, if you're playing baseball, you begin to have the hand-eye coordination that you might need in or you need in rugby. If you're doing track <clears throat> athletics, you're building that, you know, that, that, that engine or that speed, or if you're playing basketball, you know, the quick feet nature, whatever it might be. So, I think that's always really important, regardless of whether you want to go into one sport or the other professionally. And you've got to remind yourself why you're doing it. I genuinely think I look back at my career, and I can, I can say this now, I generally look back at my career and look at times where I probably just didn't enjoy it. And I then also look back at my career at times when I loved it. And guess what? The best times that I was playing in those, in my, in my except maybe when I was young, but the other times when I was loving it, I was playing so much better. And it's just the nature of how athletes work. If you are happy, you're going to be creating better performances, 100%. Great. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your retirement, about why you decided to hang up the boots at 30. What, I mean, you still have a lot left in the tank, I would assume. <laughs> what, what, how'd you go? That's it. I'm calling it. I'm kind of done. Look, well, it wasn't a decision made in two weeks and it wasn't even a decision made in two months. It was actually a decision made probably about two years ago. Um, when I finished off at, say, at Saracens and I knew that I, I wasn't going to get another um, because of some of the England internationals that were coming back in my position, my playing time was going to be minimum. And that was when I sort of pulled the trigger to say yes to Major League Rugby. I wanted that experience. My wife and I wanted to to go to the States and what better place to go than San Diego Legion. And then also not just the experience, but try and build something. I, I'm a big sort of wanting to influence and be valuable to, to an organization or a project, whatever it might be. And, and that was Major League Rugby for me. I knew as well that my career had had head injuries. I had concussions throughout my career and particularly in a spell between the age of probably about 22 to, to 27. Um, and I'd always seek 
quality medical advice, brilliant advice and, and tests and scans. And I'm, I like to think I'm fine, touch wood. And I was always fine, got the rest before I even got back onto a field. But I knew I didn't want to be that person that would take one or two more head injuries and then have to call it quits. I wanted to retire from this sport that has given me so much, but also has the potential to come to a minute to give me more outside of playing that I didn't want to be a vegetable frankly, or, you know, <laughs> scramble eggs come, come the end of my career. And and that's maybe an ego thing, but I, I, I sense that. So I signed, I even, I'll be honest, San Diego back when I signed for the 2022 season said three years. And I said, no, because I knew deep down in my mind, I wanted to get to the 2023 rugby world cup, go to another world cup, finish in France. And that would be it. What better way is there to finish than a rugby world cup now? We all know what happened and nothing that I could do about that. Um, but the reality was those two years of San Diego were amazing, particularly last season. I know we didn't win the final. I came off with a pulled hamstring at 60 minutes, but I, I nailed my touchline conversion. I remember even thinking like, this is very frustrating, but this almost feels like fate. Like I've done my bit. I knew that this was going to be my last game. It was a fantastic year to have as a last year, played in every game. And my body usually doesn't get through every game, but I played in every game. And those body-wise, head-wise, and then the opportunity that was putting in front of me, um, looking into the media, looking into journalism, which I really wanted to get into. And I looked at myself and my wife and the ability to stay here in California and then also get on this train now rather than maybe in a couple of years' time. I didn't see myself doing another four years to the other the next World Cup, and therefore, you have to remove... Someone brilliantly said it, and I think I put it in my retirement post. Sports people need to know when to leave the dance floor. The dance floor is so freaking good. But the reality is you have to remove yourself away from it. And if you know and feel like, right, that's the right time on your terms. And I was literally going pretty much from paycheck into then a paycheck or a new career. I knew for me that meant a lot. And I knew it'd be easier for me then to move on. And I'm still in rugby anyway. So that's the combination of, of why I retired in the end this year. Is this kind of what inspired the next game podcast that you were doing? Was that you were, you were yeah, having you these could, kinds of thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was 2021. Yeah, um, I was. I had <clears throat> brilliant. Someone came up to me and said, would you be interested in this? And, and I got amazing help from Saracens and, and, and others. And I really wanted to investigate excuse me i really wanted to investigate you know what what makes that good transition and some of the stories i was hearing as much as it was great for you know viewership and putting it out there as a podcast and it's still out there now if you want to go and listen to it uh, hearing those stories of guys i'll tell you what 60 percent of them struggled 70 percent of them maybe even struggled guys and girls i should say and that for me it was like well how can you get yourself ready is there a get ready I don't, I'm not sure there really is a get ready. There's stuff I'm learning now about just corporate worlds that you can't prepare for. Uh, I'm sure you'd laugh because you've been doing it a lot, of your, a lot of your years. But like the reality of just being able to get yourself in a position that you find another passion, you have another drive, and that rugby's not everything. Because if rugby's everything, I genuinely question people's happiness because you can get in some real sport is highs and lows. And that's dangerous to play with. So I enjoy doing that podcast. I enjoy helping now people with their transition. I'm still going through it. Oh, like 100%. I'm trying to find routine. But it's something which I do think is always better for people to step away from the game in their own terms rather than having to, unfortunately, in some cases have to with injury, be forced out. Um, that's my personal opinion. I like it. Oh, it's a it's a smart play to understand that there's life after the game. Do you think that's a big byproduct of of like the premiership way of like, I mean, you were recruited at 16, you know, you were playing your first professional game at 18 as an 18 year old. I could only think of one thing at a time. So do you think that that like is kind of a byproduct of that situation? Well, in all honesty, back when I started as a pro, I, it, I always say like these kind of things should have been more out there and done better. Um, the education around that, you know, 
go and get yourself a, a trade, go and give you get yourself a part time degree or work experience, whatever it might be, because we're not paid enough in rugby. Simple fact to just sit there, retire. And, you know, I, I earned some money and and that's great. But like it was nothing major. And I knew I had to work straight away. So after retiring. So I think that education, I'll probably back in my day, and this is sort of between 2010, 2012, I don't think was really there. Uh, it's becoming more prevalent now. And I know the MLR wants to do more with helping people in, in that transition phase. And, and just for me, maybe it was my parents as well. They loved the fact that I was playing rugby, but they also knew that this was not a thing forever. And um, I went to great school. My parents are incredibly supportive. And I think they knew deep down as well. They almost sort of not push me, but just prodded me to be like, you know, make sure you keep yourself well-rounded. So, you know, I think that was the the catalyst for me to make sure that I kept my, my ears to the ground and, and learned stuff away from playing sport. So when you retired, what was the conversation like with the MLR? Did they come immediately to you? And they're like, we already know you like podcasting. We already know you want to be a, a sports pundit. Here's what we got for you. We want you to be the technical director. How did that all go down? Yeah, technical director. I mean, it's... Uh... I still probably don't know completely what we're, I, I, I'm figuring it out. Um, you know, try, finding my feet. Look, it was something which came around probably near the beginning of the year. Um, Major League Rugby with San Diego, <clears throat> small discussions in terms of media opportunities. And then it was probably the end of April, beginning of May. I went to the ownership here at Ryan Patterson. He's brilliant. Um, and I said, look, Ryan, I'm, I'm going to hang up my boots at the end of the season. I'm out of respect. I'm telling you now. Um, the idea of continuing to play and being wanted was great. Um, but this is what you know I wanted to do. My wife and I don't feel that we're done with California. And you know, I've been involved in some projects with MLR, whether it's been some of the all-access stuff, uh, partnership building with loose heads, bringing loose heads in, into uh, the United States, uh, M Pro, whatever it might be. So. It was almost from those small things they kind of knew. And then and I think their position of wanting to bring a player into the organization and how I fit in the organization. So I'm still finding out and media is more the route being in the broadcast team for the, for the future season coming, uh, coming up. Sorry. I'm really looking forward to some of the media projects, some of the partnership project projects I'm part of as well. And, and having that player perspective, I'll be honest, well, been in this role for a bit longer hope if i ever get the chance to hire potentially any other people i'd be looking to ex players tomorrow you know because of their understanding of the game their drive but also the outside of the box thinking um i'm not saying that i have all of that by the way not at all but that for me is probably what got me into the position of they were like yeah we'd like to bring someone like will in um and i'm very grateful for the opportunity and i'm trying to do all my best to learn fast, to be valuable, and, and grow the sport one way or the other. You've gone through all my questions. Is there anybody that you'd like to shout out that you want to like give remarks to? I know that you're a big loose heads guy. I know, you, obviously, you got the rundown that's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the rugby rundown, which is this, uh, it's in its infancy, but <clears throat> it's going well. And, you know, we wanted to try and, um, I, I, I say I um, wanted to try and build a project that, really encapsulates rugby news visually verbally um and education oh, we're working on things like this and then being analysis from former players who've been there and done that it's not just me and alex corpusiero this project is going to go with uh women stars um stay tuned for that in a couple of weeks um it's going to go with other directions in the college game really building we've got some potential live events rolling in for this year so it's honestly, I, I really believe it's hopefully something that people can get behind because our thought process is right out here. It's not just we're in a studio, just me and Corbs having a chat. It's um, we want to really grow this thing. And I think with the rugby network being behind us, um, which is great, we can do that. Um, it's uh, it takes a lot of work, though. The product of rugby as well. I'm wearing Nate Allsberg as uh uh, um, attire so um, yeah shout out to them um, appreciate what they're doing as I say loose heads as well and stay tuned MLR's coming around the corner